Docks stranded in the mud, boats abandoned on cracked earth. Utah's Great Salt Lake is vanishing, not just drying up. As its waters retreat, a toxic legacy emerges. Dust laced with arsenic and heavy metals now threatens more than 2 million people downwind. How did the West's largest saltwater lake turn from an ecological marvel to a public health disaster? And can it be reversed before dust clouds reshape life for an entire region? Long before water diversions and drought, the Great Salt Lake was a geologic marvel, a shimmering remnant of ancient Lake Bonneville that once covered much of western Utah. Today, it stands as the largest saltwater lake in the Western Hemisphere, known for its hypersaline waters and vast wetlands. This unique chemistry supports an ecosystem found nowhere else on the continent. Every year, millions of migratory birds descend on the lake, relying on rich brine flies and brine shrimp to fuel their journeys along the Pacific Flyway. American avocets, eared grebes, and pelicans gather in numbers that rival any site in North America. The lake's wetlands act as nurseries for countless species, while open water and mudflats offer safe haven for birds traveling thousands of miles. As one local bird biologist says, if we lose the Great Salt Lake, we lose one of the most important stopovers for birds in the entire hemisphere. The lake's ecological abundance is not just a point of pride for Utah, it is a linchpin in a global network of life. Water reaches the Great Salt Lake almost entirely from three rivers, the Bear, Weber, and Jordan. The Bear alone supplies close to 40% of the lake's inflow, making it the single most important source. Together, these rivers account for about 70% of all water entering the lake each year. But most of that water never arrives. Over decades, farms, cities, and industry have built a system of canals, diversions, and reservoirs that intercept water upstream. State records show that about 73% of the lake's historic inflow is now diverted or consumed before it ever reaches the shoreline. That matches the lake's 73% loss in water volume since the 1980s and a 60% reduction in surface area. As a state hydrologist explains, every gallon we take upstream is a gallon the lake never sees. Drought and warming have made things worse, but the math is clear. The main driver of the lake's decline is human use. In December 2022, the Great Salt Lake reached its lowest elevation ever recorded. Shorelines that once hugged the edge of Salt Lake City and Ogden retreated by miles, leaving boats stranded and docks perched above nothing but dust and salt. Satellite images showed vast new stretches of exposed lake bed circling the water, a stark contrast to the blue expanse seen just decades earlier. State hydrologists and university scientists gathered evidence in the field, confirming that the lake's decline had reached a critical point. One scientist described the situation simply, we are at the red line. This is no longer just about lost water. The exposed lake bed, once hidden under brine, now poses a direct hazard. Arsenic and other metals concentrated over centuries in this closed basin are no longer locked away. The crisis has shifted from slow decline to immediate risk, forcing public officials and residents to confront what a shrinking Great Salt Lake means for everyone living nearby. Wind strips find particles from the exposed lake bed and carries them straight into the lungs of more than 2 million people living along the Wasatch Front. These airborne grains, known as PM10 and PM2.5, are small enough to slip past the body's defenses, settling deep within airways and even entering the bloodstream. The dust is not just an inconvenience. It is laced with arsenic and other heavy metals that have accumulated over centuries, now released every time a gust lifts the sediment skyward. Local clinics and hospitals report spikes in asthma attacks and breathing problems on days after major dust storms. During one April event, air monitors recorded sharp rises in particulate levels and emergency rooms saw a rush of patients struggling to breathe. Dr. Sarah Lang, a Salt Lake pulmonologist, says that anybody with lungs is at risk when the dust blows. She says they are seeing more patients with asthma flare-ups and new respiratory symptoms, even in people with no previous history. For families in Magna and West Valley, dust days mean closed windows, missed school, and a constant worry about what is in the air their children breathe. The threat is invisible, but its effects are undeniable. As the lake's water drops and salt concentrations climb, the entire web of life faces a breaking point. Brine shrimp, once so abundant they supplied up to 45% of the world's aquaculture feed, now struggle to survive. When salinity crosses key thresholds, shrimp eggs fail to hatch, brine flies vanish, and the algae that feed them both begin to die off. The collapse at the bottom of the food chain ripples outward, and millions of birds lose their crucial stopover. 
The region's billion dollar industries are thrown into uncertainty. Brine shrimp harvesters have seen their catch plummet. A longtime worker recalls that brine shrimp catches are down 50% some years since the lake turned so salty and we skip days. We have never done that before. The economic stakes are enormous. Together, brine shrimp, mineral extraction, and recreation have brought $1.3 billion a year to Utah's economy. If the lake tips past recovery, those jobs and that revenue go with it, impacting not just local workers, but global food supply chains that rely on Utah's unique ecosystem. Nearly 800 square miles of exposed lake bed now ring the Great Salt Lake, a footprint larger than the island of Maui. What was once hidden under brine is now a vast expanse of silty playa, an active source of wind-blown dust, and something else less visible but just as significant. Recent studies show these dried sediments are releasing greenhouse gases on a massive scale. In 2020 alone, the exposed bed emitted an estimated 4.1 million tons of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That is more than the annual emissions of some small cities. The process is simple but powerful. As the crust dries and breaks apart, buried organic material and minerals oxidize, releasing carbon dioxide that would have remained sealed underwater. Atmospheric scientists tracking these changes warn that the shrinking lake is not just a regional disaster, but a contributor to global climate change. Dr. Kevin Perry, who studies dust and emissions from Utah's playas, explains, every acre of exposed lake bed is another source of greenhouse gases and airborne contaminants. The longer the lake stays low, the more the exposed bed amplifies both local and global risks. The risks of the Great Salt Lake crisis are not shared equally. Along the lake's southern and western edges, many neighborhoods most exposed to toxic dust are home to lower income families, recent immigrants, and communities of color. Water diverted upstream keeps lawns green and industries running, but it is often these frontline residents who breathe the fallout. In Magna and Glendale, families report keeping children indoors on dust days, with little choice but to wait out the haze. Community organizers say relocation is not an option for most, and air purifiers or medical care can be out of reach. A local organizer explains that people here are doing everything they can, but we are the ones who pay the price when the wind blows. This pattern echoes the Salton Sea in California and the Aral Sea in Central Asia, where those with the fewest resources bore the greatest health burden from dust and neglect. The crisis is not just about water and air, it is about who gets to be safe and who is left at risk. Restoring the Great Salt Lake is not a matter of wishful thinking or small-scale conservation. Scientists and state water managers agree the lake needs a legally protected minimum level. Specifically, the southern arm must stay above 4,192 feet in elevation to avoid irreversible damage. Anything lower, and the ecosystem begins to unravel. Industry grinds to a halt, and toxic dust risks escalate. Meeting this threshold is not possible without a dramatic increase in water reaching the lake. According to Utah's 2023 strategic plan, the state must restore between 471,000 and 1 million acre feet of additional inflow each year, hundreds of thousands more than current voluntary efforts provide. As Brian Steed, Utah's Great Salt Lake Commissioner, puts it, below 4,192 feet, the consequences are severe and lasting. Without a binding mandate and major changes to water use, the lake could cross into functional death within years, setting off a cascade of ecological, economic, and public health disasters. Right now, over 2 million people are breathing the consequences of choices made upstream. Science warns the lake could reach ecological collapse within this decade. Whether Utah faces a toxic dust bowl or restores a living lake depends on decisions made today. The stakes are no longer distant, they are in the air, 